we're making conversations about education count. Hello there, it's time for another Making Conversations Count with me, Wendy Harris. And in this episode, I have a professor that is joining us. He is the head of school for the University of Manchester and Manchester Metropolitan Architects Department. And he has had a really interesting career, which I get chatting to him about because he's got some really diverse roots in different camps. But ultimately, and this is at the heart of this conversation, is going to be this phrase that responsibility is what you assume. So let's head on in and say hello to Kevin Singh. What strikes me, I think, Kevin, is you are clearly a leader in your field with the University of Manchester. And you've been able to take sort of what you've learned in the real world and take that through to students that are coming through. Now, that's a real skill in itself because when you're dealing with young people, and I know this having gone through it with one of my own children, they get to a certain age where they haven't kind of set their sights necessarily on what it is they're going to be, but they're working towards something, yet they still know everything. So how do you find the challenge of being able to communicate to a group about your topic of architecture to actually engage with them so that they listen. The context is slightly different as the head of school. I should actually say it's the Manchester School of Architecture, which is a joint school between Manchester Metropolitan University and the University of Manchester. But when you're the head of such a big department, you know, the kind of interactions with students is pretty limited, really. Probably easier to talk about leading staff rather than students. But having said that, when I do lectures around sort of professional practice, you know, I, I suppose what I try and say to students is there's, there's no, not quite there's no right or wrong, but there isn't a particular path that you should follow. And I talk a lot, and I've only learned this recently, I think in a way, I talk a lot about not comparing, have your career, have the career you want, try and be in control. And of course, that's a very easy thing to say and a difficult thing to manage. But I think it goes back to this sense of being very self-aware, having a vision, if that's too, not too strong a word, what am I trying to achieve here? And and certainly that idea of vision and sort of taking responsibility are things that are sort of values I've tried to bring to my leadership. Yeah, saying to a student, you know, don't sort of look over your shoulder or look to the side and say, oh yeah, but they're doing that. You know, certainly in my architecture business, there was a time when I was like, oh, you know, we're five, 10 years old, the same as them. They've got 15 staff. We've only got five. What are we doing wrong? And then someone said to me, yeah, but how many of those people are running a school of architecture alongside the business? And I went, well, yeah, none of them, obviously. And so they said, yeah, but so why the comparison? You know, it's not healthy. Yeah, I suppose I try and get students to be in control of their own destiny or yeah, I mean, see themselves, the, the qualities they have and yeah, and try and forge a career from that, really, rather than thinking there's a template that they need to fit into. Yes, it's, it's an easy trap to fall into, isn't it, Kevin, that you can do it the same way as somebody else? Yeah, because comparisons tend to lead to disappointment. <laughs> so, <laughs> and of course, that is one of the problems with, you know, I suppose contemporary society with, you know, Instagram culture, young people do present the best of their lives. And it can be easy for people to think, you know, that's the reality. Well, of course it's a snippet. I was quite a big Facebook user. And people would often say to me, oh, you're always out, you're always traveling. And I'm like, yeah, but I don't post when I'm sat on the sofa watching Netflix. You know, so <laughs> you just, you see a disproportionate, you know, section of my life. That's the point, isn't it? I think that comes with some maturity that, intention and purpose has got to be at the forefront of what your goals and ambitions are, got to align in some way. So you can't compare with anybody else because 
they're going to have different ambitions to you, want to achieve different things. What got you into being head of school when clearly you've got a thriving architectural practice yourself? What was it that drew you into getting involved in that side of the business? Well, I mean, there are many points in my academic career when I said, oh, you know, I've got no ambition to be a head of school. I would have said before that I don't want to be a program leader, you know, a course director. And I think that goes back to the point I'm just making, really. I've been very fortunate in my career, and I think luck is important as well. But I've let things unfold. There wasn't a master plan. It wasn't, oh, I'm, you know, I'm going to do this, and then I'm going to do this. Because, again, maybe that's where you end up comparing reality to what you hoped. And then, you know, that can be disappointing as well. I got into teaching as a complete accident. They were paying, I think it was six pounds an hour in the mid nineties. I think if you worked in a bar, it was three pound, three pound 50. And the first morning I did it, absolutely fell in love with it. Very quickly decided I wanted it to be a career. And then, you know, sort of the rest is history, really, really enjoyed teaching, helping people, the sense of satisfaction. I think that goes back to what, you know, again, what we were talking about before, this idea of, you know, who are you? What floats your boat? What gets you up in the morning? You know, and, and make the most of that. I mean, I've got, you know, sometimes people say, and they find out you're an architect, or what, you know, what famous buildings have you designed? And I say, well, probably none actually, you know, but I've done buildings and projects that have helped people with their lives, but, you know, I've taken another route. And I don't feel that, you know, because I haven't designed a famous tower block that, you know, I'm not a proper architect. You know, again, it's that thing about finding your niche, really. One of the things I say to people all the time, because they say, oh, you've got three jobs, you know, you've got the bar, you've got a practice, you teach at the university. I'm like, yeah, but I wake up every day and I just go and do what I do. I don't go to work, you know, and how privileged is that to do things that you absolutely love? There's an old saying, and I don't know who said it, maybe Jim Rohn or somebody like that, that says, you know, do what you love and you never work a day in your life, isn't it? It's that sort of concept. Yeah. Spot on, yeah. Which what? I think goes then to that point of saying to students, you know, try and have your career because, you know, you're far more likely to enjoy it. I mean, if you enjoy social housing and, you know, small domestic projects, that's not better or worse than designing big office buildings, you know, each to their own, really. Doesn't that just fall into a different category of, well, actually you can feel a real sense of pride because you of the contribution that you make. Yeah. I mean, probably legacy is too strong a word, but I certainly know where I feel most reward is that sense of satisfaction. You know, when you see a student that was failing or was desperate to get a 2-1 and you help them achieve it, or they went on to get a great job. And I've got an ex-student who, unbelievably talented, you know, at drawing, has left the profession and has now set up his own business as an artist, as an illustrator. And it's really satisfying to see that, you know, he's gone on to do something that he's clearly passionate about. He works from home, he's got a young family. It's perfect for him. And it's not a failure that he didn't practice for long as an architect. He's just found his calling. That's great, really. I'm still waiting for my calling to be a professional footballer, but I think it's a little bit too late for me. <laughs> <laughs> Not one that I'm going to get called up for either, I don't think, Kevin. It, it fascinates me that, you know, we've got this next generation coming through. What would your observation be in, has the teaching and the communication changed much? Certainly with what we've just been through with COVID times, has that made any real dent? I think higher education is incredibly professional these days and people that aren't close to it don't realise that. And I think it's very disheartening for academics when you read things in the papers about, you know, meaningless degrees and how, you know, tutors getting time off. I mean, people say to me, what, you know, what do you do in the summer? I'm like, I do my job. My job's full-time year-round job, you know, it's, we don't all go off and sit on a beach for two months. And then those claims that, you know, online was somehow easier and cheaper and, you know, people worked unbelievably hard in the pandemic. But aside from that, yeah, it is very professional, you know, and it's big business. Universities are hundreds of millions of pounds worth of business and they have to be run properly. 
So I think you find that universities are, and, you know, teaching and uh, the whole, yeah, it's, it's very professional. There's a lot of responsibility. There's a real onus on being student centric, you know, like really focusing on helping the students. In my day at architecture school, you could pass the first year, but they would throw you out. They'd say, sorry, you know, not good enough. We don't think you've got huge potential. You know, it's a far more protected or protective environment now for students to operate in. And teaching isn't easy and academia can be very stressful. So I think you find the vast majority of people in academia, you know, are incredibly passionate about helping students and, you know, the next generation. I think it's an absolute privilege to, to shape the next generation of, in our case, architects and landscape architects and urban designers, but wherever anybody teaches and, you know, and obviously the same goes for school teachers as well. It was a bit like the Titanic needed to be moved quite quickly away from the iceberg. I've got a daughter that's that's in high school education. So to see how those lesson plans changed and shifted and the communication was quickly adopted and changed and tested and the feedback that everybody was able to give meant that no real time was lost. Like you say about headlines, you hear headlines saying, you know, we're behind or we could have saved, continue to save money or that's not really the main driver. It should be about the student and their future. It's the student experience. And I mean, go, again, going back to those ideas of shaping your own career, I think this sense of choice, a willingness to, to sort of not have one size that fits all. So the Manchester School of Architecture, for example, we have eight atelier groups. So these are specialist studio groups that students vote to go into. And they can follow, you know, agendas which are aligned with what they're interested in. So we have an atelier that's very much around sort of climate change, for example. We have one that's around computational design. There's one that has a feminist agenda. And so we use the phrase celebrating difference. We recognize all the students are different. You have different backgrounds, you have different skills, abilities, different ambitions. And, you know, let's try and cater for them. You know, if universities were some of the things that people accuse them of, we wouldn't give that level of choice. We wouldn't give that level of, you know, it's almost a bespoke education as much as it mm. could be. Although in architecture, we do have professional body criteria that we need to teach. And so it's that balance between, you know, the, the critical things that people need to know about making buildings safe. And you think about the Grenfell tragedy, for example, with that balance of trying to let people define their careers. I would go as far as to say as well that by showing all of those aspects, you know, by having a little window into topics that probably are not of interest to the student can open fresh doors to passions that they didn't know that they were going to have. They could be passionate about one particular thing and be quite struck that that's the path that they're going to follow. But actually by saying, here's the wide world of architecture and all the different aspects that goes on in our world, there's that marvellous fascination of finding out and exploring new things. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and but again, sorry to sound like a stuck record, but I think it goes back to that thing as well to say, if you're interested in that, how, however you discover it, that's absolutely fine. One isn't better or worse. I mean, I, most of my sort of architecture career has been working with existing buildings in my sandwich year between my degree and master's, I worked for a, a sort of medium-sized practice up in Carlisle. And one of their big clients was a food processing factory. And one day I got asked to work on the design of a canteen. I remember that something like the, the flow wasn't particularly good. And I remember saying to the guy I was working for, if I can just block this wall up and make a new opening, a new entrance here, it will really unlock it. And... I think from that moment on, I really love that sort of puzzle of working with an existing building, unlocking, you know, sort of potential. And certainly 20 years ago, that, that wasn't cool in architecture. You know, that was seen as the realm of perhaps an interior designer. You know, and now the Architects Journal, which is, you know, one of the, one of the mainstay magazines, has retrofit awards, you know, and of course now with the sustainability agenda, working with existing buildings is incredibly important. 
you know, I suppose I felt like a bit of a, I mean, trailblazer is far too strong a word, but I felt I was operating in a slightly different area to what would be normal mainstream. And my business partner at the space studio is an interior designer as well. And I taught interior design. So I suppose I feel quite sort of satisfied now that it's mainstream architectural practice when sort of 20 years ago, it wasn't. But again, it goes back to that thing about, you know, what are you passionate about? You know, not comparing to my friend who at the time was probably designing art galleries or something, 20 story towers or whatever it was. If anybody was wanting to come through into architecture as a sort of leading topic, what would your one key bit of advice be to them, Kevin? I think it's just enthusiasm and passion. I mean, architecture is a very challenging education. You know, it's five years at university, at least a couple of years in industry, and then at least another year of professional exams, you know, looking at, you know, eight, nine, even 10 years to qualify. So that's not for the faint hearted, you know, I mean, you need to be very committed to seeing that all the way through. Not that you have to see it all the way through. I mean, many people will get a degree, which goes on to be, you know, an amazing education in itself. I've got an ex-student who's now an air traffic controller. You know, he had a degree in architecture, you know, had very good spatial awareness. He went into a, you know, into air traffic control aviation. I think first of all, being really passionate and committed to it is really important, but, and this is obviously a personal take for me, that sense of helping people, you know, we design things that change the world, you know, even if that's someone's house, you know, well, design an out nice house, not a cheap one or one that. I don't mean cheap, as in, you know, in the market, but, you know, don't cut corners, do the design process properly, you know, have ambitions regardless of the budget for it and so on. Uh, one of the nicest projects I ever did, and I think to this date, it's still my only testimonial on LinkedIn, <laughs> but it was a, a single mom, two kids, and it was a loft conversion that we did. And she moved up into the roof and had some privacy and her daughter got her bedroom and her son got the other room. And, you know, she was in tears of joy when it was finished. I mean, she couldn't believe, you know, what we'd achieved in her budget and how it had changed the life of her family. Yeah, you know, it's an incredibly satisfying feeling. That's the impact that you can make. It doesn't have to be a 100-storey office block or shopping centre. We do lots of social housing in our practice. And, uh, you know, again, had, you know, feedback from residents that, you know, wonderful place to live. They never imagined they could live in a house like this and so on. So, I mean, for me, architecture is about, is about changing people's lives, but you know, not for everybody. People see it in, in different ways, but you know, if you are quite a, a generous person, sort of generous in spirit, wanting to help people, architecture is an amazing profession and career. I hear that loud and clear. And I think your sentiment really can apply to just about any industry that you've got that passion for thank you absolutely yeah we're going to carry on that conversation in just a moment but first what's new wendy Wu? well this week's tip is in line with the conversation that we're having with professor kevin and of course when responsibility is something you assume And it comes to you looking after those conversations that you've had with potential new clients. That responsibility comes down to you making a note of when to get back in touch with people. I always teach that you should have a set process in place and a timescale assigned to that next action. But of course, the customer should be leading you with those time frames. And that's part of the conversation that they're involved in when that would be. So consider how you're going to keep on top of going back to them at the right time so you never miss an opportunity. So Kevin, it comes to the part in the show where I always say to guests, bring along a conversation that counted for you. So are you ready? I've got two actually, but if it's only one you want, then I I know which one was the most important one. So in the mid nineties, I was doing a master's and I was leading the student society at the Birmingham School of Architecture and I ran the society. 
and arranged a, an evening lecture by a couple, Sarah Chaplin, Eric Holden, actually, who were, um, you know, really influential to me. And actually they were the people that said, don't just do what everybody else does. You know, you can follow your own career. And I, I organized this lecture and this is before the days of mobile phones and they were late and they would, they'd come up from Oxford and I didn't have any sense of how far away they were. And I had a room of probably 200 people, 150 people. Gosh. You know, when's it starting? I was panicking. I'm a very punctual person anyway, so I'm sure it was part of that. But I had this room of people and one of my tutors said to me, you know, do you know why you feel like this? Why are you feeling the pressure? And he said, and I'll never forget it. He said, responsibility is what you assume. I'd organized a lecture. I'd assumed the responsibility. I'd taken it on. And so I felt responsible for, you know, all of those people and for the time that they'd given to kind of come to the event. I mean, fortunately they turned up not long after and everything was fine. But I think that's something that, and of course it works very subconsciously for a long time, but in the things that I lead, I like to give people responsibility. You know, I think most people won't let you down. You know, they can feel a sense of autonomy to sort of shine if you like and to, you know, and you empower them. And so I think the sort of extension of that is that I've become a, a really big believer in structures, you know, organizational structures and also recruitment that if you recruit the right people into the right structure and the structure is right, then you leave them to get on with it. And they assume that responsibility majority of the time, they don't let you down. I think that quote responsibility is what you assume in my previous job. I haven't said it <laughs> so much here, but in my previous job, I used to say the phrase to your dog, Charlie Brown, you know, and it reminded me, you know, Snoopy where when Snoopy was naughty, all the other kids would go, is your dog, Charlie Brown, you sort him out, you make it all right. And I think it's that same principle, you know, you're responsible for something make it right. And that was, I would say that was about 1995, 1996. I think it's it stood the test of time as well as, and I'm not even sure it was mentors kind of advice, really. I think it was more of an observation by a guy called Steve Ferrar. I think it was more of an observation by him really stuck with me. But again, I, it probably didn't stick with me instantly. I think years later, it's found its way to the front of my mind again. And I suppose when I, when people, maybe when people have said to me, well, why, you know, why do you trust me? Why do you give me this responsibility? I suppose I probably tried to think about when I understood what responsibility was. And I think that was probably the point. It's that word trust, isn't it? If you can underpin people with that, that value, the structure that you're talking about is the culture of wherever it is that you work in. And if you've got the right sort of culture, it can feel like family. And then you go back to what we were talking about earlier, which is if you're doing the thing that you love, it's never going to feel like work. As a leader, I don't, you know, really try and use that word rather than, than manager, you know, I think leading and management, leadership and management are two almost entirely different things for me. But I think you can start to launch, you know, kind of a vision, if you like, a way forward once you know, you know what you're passionate about, you know what you believe in once you know what the structure is. And then it becomes really easy to sort of make decisions moving forward because you say, well, that's the vision, that's the structure. The decisions should kind of almost make themselves because they fit or they don't fit. You know, are they in line with what you're trying to do? I think where that also becomes really useful is when you talk about patience, you know, things don't happen instantly, certainly in higher education. Um, 20 year overnight success story, you mean? <laughs> you know, in, in my personal life and in the moment, I'm probably not a very patient person, you know, literally in the moment, if I'm, I don't know, I'm in a queue or I'm waiting at a bar or something, you know, but in my professional career, I've been incredibly patient. I mean, my architect's practice is 21 years old and it's probably only the last almost post pandemic actually that it's been you know, it's gone to another level and has become, you know, sort of particularly profitable, et cetera. And, and in education, I think when you have that vision and that structure, it almost encourages you to be patient because you know, it can't all happen at the same time. So you sort of have a roadmap for where you 
want to get to. And it really helps you be patient because you say, okay, the next time I can appoint a new member of staff, they need to go in there because that's the next most important thing to achieve the vision. Yeah, I, th- I think that combination of structure and vision, and of course, one's very sort of soft in a way and one's very logistical. But that combination of those two, I think, yeah, I think they're just the foundations for pretty much everything I've ever done, really. Yet with all of those things, you have to start somewhere. You know, in, in architecture education, I'll talk a lot about white paper problem. You know, a student has to design the building and they start with a, with a white piece of paper, a blank piece of paper. And you'd often get students who are almost paralyzed to design anything because they want it to be perfect straight away. Hmm. And it can never be perfect straight away. You know, design is an iterative process. You know, you have to go through tens, hundreds of iterations. And so I'd always say to students, start, just start. And the first thing you draw will probably be really horrible, but that's okay. Because without the first one, there isn't the second one and the third one and the 10th one and the 20th one and the final one. And that's advice that, you know, I I follow my own advice with that. When I'm designing something, I just start. And sometimes you look at the first thing you've drawn and designed and you're like, oh God, that really, you know, (laughs) that really isn't very good. But then you learn the lesson from it. And I think it's the same in, you know, again, in leadership, when you're managing people, leading people, initiatives is, you know, if it's well intended and again, it goes with the vision and all of that kind of thing, just make a start, just try it. And yeah, of course it won't be perfect and accept it won't be perfect, but how do you improve it? And eventually you can refine it to a point where, you know, it works really well. But I think what's a real problem is when people won't try something because they know it won't be perfect and then you paralyze and then you never move forward and you just don't improve things. So there's many times when, you know, something we're working on at the moment, something I've done before, which is a a sort of nuanced assessment system to say, you know, don't compare apples and pears. You know, one person might design a really small building in lots of detail. Someone might design a really big building that's really theoretical in not very much detail. You can't compare those. And you shouldn't assess them the same, really, because they have different ambitions, different agendas. So we're trying to work on a system that rewards what people have set out to do. It's something I did previously in my previous school. It's something that I've tried to bring here as well. We didn't crack it in one go. We've kept continuing to improve it. And, you know, and hopefully soon it will be where it needs to be. But if you don't try, you know, I think that's the problem. And that's the nuance, isn't it, of being able to reward individuals because they are set differently to the next person and the next person that that is tackling the same task. The proof is in the pudding, really, that, you know, having a bar, having an architect's practice, running a school of architecture, that these are values and lessons that have been able to be applied, you know, across them. So it sort of proves that they're not just for architecture practice or they're not just for education. Because they are really about dealing with people and how you get the best out of people and relationships you have with people. When someone, one of my staff said to me recently, so, well, how do you, you know, how have you got all of this extra support? How, how have you been able to do this, this, and this? So it's simple. It's, it's relationships. You know, if you have good relationships with people, you know, you're far more likely to, you know, to be able to achieve what you're trying to achieve. If you go around, you know, arguing with everybody and, making enemies of people, who's who's going to help you? Mm. Why would they? And likewise, even if you're trying to achieve a goal on your own, doesn't mean that you don't need the support of other people. Yeah. And, you know, mentors are, are, are really great. I and mean, I don't think I've really sort of formally had a, a mentor, but I had a psychometric test once for a, for a job and, you know, and some interesting things sort of came out of that. And I think sometimes as, you know, as we've talked about today with that one conversation, sometimes you don't know where that sort of really salient advice is going to come from where that penny drops. And so, yeah, I think talking to ranges of people, architects were terrible that we, we sort of all know all the other architects and <laughs> we don't always know people as much outside the profession. But, you know, I love talking to people in other, other industries and disciplines. I was talking to a guy that runs a distillery here in Manchester the other day, and we we're just talking about, you know, dealing with staff and dealing with people. People are people. It all boils down to the same thing at the end of the day, doesn't it? I think it does. 
If anybody wanted to carry on the conversation with you in terms of architectural or, or the leadership that you've spoken about today, what would be the best thing for them to do? Well, I've been happy to start conversations probably by LinkedIn. That's probably quite a good way. Yeah, my LinkedIn profile is pretty, <laughs> pretty easy to find. Thank you so much. We'll put the details on the show notes for people to be able to get in touch. I've thoroughly enjoyed our conversation. Thank you so much for joining us on the show. Thanks for the invitation. It's been really interesting reflecting, actually. Oh, good. I'll, I'll reflect some more now. <laughs> <laughs> what responsibility do you assume? Has it got you thinking about that? Do drop us a line at the show. We love to hear your comments and feedback. And of course, when it comes to opportunities, stay open-minded. Next time, we're joined by the tilt guy, Joe Blizzy. It took me 22 months to even realize that we had an audience here and we were saying something. And then I didn't even know we were going to make it till probably 2011.